Welcome back to part two of The Guilty Feminist. So plug in and get ready for the fun. Hello, York. Are you ready for the rest of The Guilty Feminist? Then please welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis White. Hello, hello, hello. Matthew, did you come back? Yes. In which case, I am going to give you this glass... I mean, glass. This coffee cup of Prosecco. (laughs) Just because if you love a Matthew, let him go. If he comes back, he's yours. If he doesn't, lock the doors. Now, (laughs) Matthew, would you like this? I've realised that I poured it quite quickly backstage and it's fizzy. I've realised that this is in Australia. If someone handed you this in Australia, uh, you'd say, tides out. Um... (laughs) The tide's out I'm, on this, I'm afraid. It's less than half full. <laughs> but Matthew, less than half full is a famous quote from which Virginia Woolf? <laughs> which... The, he's been Googling. <laughs> the waves, tides out. That is correct, absolutely. Uh, uh, which, which book often goes with... Can you hand that to Matthew, please? Thank you. Or just you get it back to him somehow through the power of feminism by passing it back. Thank you, yes. Oh, this is actually a good one for human Google. Matthew, human Google this. What is the first line of Mrs. Dalloway? Human Google, just say it with authority. We'll trust you. Doesn't have to be good, Matthew. Just has to be. Open the door. A woman immediately went, no. (laughs) Just went, no, nothing like it. What is it, in fact? That's correct. Mrs. Dalloway said she'd buy the flowers herself. I have recently realised that within my audience, we could name every Virginia Woolf book and probably do quite a lot of the first lines because my audience is so erudite. I've realised this recently, because um, a guest didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't able to come on stage, and so I had to turn to the audience in... Was it Reading? Reading. I had to turn to the audience in Reading and say, oh, who's got a feminist job? Like I was doing a bit of crowd work. What they didn't know was I was searching for guests. <laughs> and then after they told me their feminist jobs, I was like, oh, would you like to come on stage? I mean, I told them at the beginning, just so they had a little time to prepare mentally, just enough time to ruin the full show for them. Um, and <laughs> then they came up and we had an absolutely incredible time. I want to start doing something called town halls, Guilty Feminist Town Halls, where we just, just try and solve a problem together with the small panel and the audience. Because I think you actually know... Collectively, you will definitely know more than me and any comedians we've got here. I mean, not Matthew, but you, the, <laughs> the, you know, the rest of you. Would you be up for doing a town hall? Yeah. Because yeah. we're going to do one in London, but I'd really like to do one up north because I think everything is done, everything's done in London all the time. I don't know if you've noticed that. You're, I don't know if you've noticed that London dominates this country in quite a frightening way. Um, and I, I say this as someone with London privilege. Um, We'd love to bring it to you if you'd like to have it. But my question is, how far would you go for a Guilty Feminist Town Hall? Would you go to Manchester? (laughs) Some people... Some people, some people have... uh, When I've said the word Manchester, have acted as if I've said the seventh circle of hell. Um, what, What was the response to Manchester? Okay, it takes four hours to get there from here. That's a fair objection. But I felt some of those were more emotional. They're more emotionally based. Is that because when things happen up north, they happen in Manchester? Yeah. 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 What was that? Leeds. We've... Wow. It's like I've said Expelliarmus. Leeds! Okay, are we doing Leeds, Stuart? Are we doing Leeds on this tour? No. <laughs> Give us a cheer if you're from Leeds. <laughs> and you know full well we're not going there because that's why you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Pop down Leeds for the next tour, Stuart. Okay. Are you ready for the second half? 
We have a phenomenal stand-up comedian. You will have seen her on all the television shows there are. She is one of the best stand-up comics in this country, nay, the world. She is genuinely one of the funniest people I've met in real life. And I always love it when she has time to come on The Guilty Feminist because she's so busy off doing such glamorous things. So could you please put your hands together? That would be, yeah, like that. And make very excited noises. Break laws if necessary to welcome the incredible Kiri Pritchard McLean. York. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely love that Deborah was so confident to go on stage and just blithely start the War of the Roses again. That was a good moment for everyone, wasn't it? Manchester, I'd rather fucking die. <laughs> feeling, uh, feeling quite self-conscious tonight. Um, I uh, had a big dinner before I go on stage. I never do that. And it is sitting on me in an unflattering trouser. So <laughs> do know that I know, okay? <laughs> I've definitely lost, like the pandemic did for me. I've lost my sense of style. I completely lost what I was doing with myself. Because I mean, I'll be like most of you. I basically spent two years either in my PJs or my trackies, only really washing when I could smell my own fanny. That was the situ. <laughs> The rest of the time, I was endlessly doom scrolling through Instagram, being influenced things that I, that I end up buying, and I end up buying things for a personality that I'll never have. <laughs> Convincing myself, I will wear more feathers when the world starts again. <laughs> and then it means that I just don't know how to, I'm trying to wear all those clothes and get some use of, out of them now, now that the world's open up again. And it basically means the other day I was like leaving my house, as you leave my house, there's a full length mirror. I clocked myself in the full length mirror. I was in a tankine in a balaclava. It's too much. <laughs> it's too much for the co-op. Turn it in. <laughs> <laughs> I've, um, I think I've got I, I have a, a sense of style that I, I'm finding back again My, I love anything shiny I love a sequin catches the light very nicely helps you shoplift I love a sequin <laughs> and a statement earring um, the statement being I don't fit in anything else in Topshop that's the fucking statement <laughs> classic fat girl stuff that isn't it we've always got banging jewellery handbags and shoes because you can't get too fat for those I thought <laughs> genuinely managed to chuck my way out of a pair of shoes in lockdown that's a dark fucking day <laughs> there are a pair of heels a bit like the ones I've got on now where they've got like an ankle strap right and I know I gave you a flash but it was really quick because I was like they probably saw my varicose veins then <laughs> I'm such a feminist I'm not paying to sort them out so <laughs> so they're ankle, ankle ones right and I, I went to do the ankle strap on them and there was about an inch gap and these had previously been my favourite shoes. And as I was down there, I thought, well, they must have shrunk in the wash. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever Vaseline your own cankle, but it's not, it's not ideal self-esteem-wise. I mean, I, I joke about Topshot going under. I, I'm glad. I hope he drowns on his yacht, the tax-dodging cunt. I truly do. <laughs> Woo! We've all got something from there, though, haven't we? <laughs> And I don't know where to go now because the top shop used to be like, it used to be my go-to place, right? And I'm in a difficult sort of situation. I'm in my mid-30s now, so I feel like I'm in a weird bit transitionally with my style. Also, I'm plus size. I've never been particularly welcome on the high street. Best case scenario, they give us one sad corner in the shop where they put our polyester thrush trousers <laughs> and our waterfall cardigans. That's what they put there. I swear to God, it's different music that plays in that corner. <laughs> I think it's whatever those four lads from the Titanic were playing as it went down. <laughs> so, so when things opened up again, I was like, I'm going to treat myself, can I have a bit of retail therapy? So I went back and I was just, I was trying desperately to find somewhere that would take my money. I was like, where do I go now? Where do I shop? I'm wandering up and down. I wandered into Urban Outfitters. Spoiler alert, it's not fucking there. <laughs> there was a, Palpable tension in the air when I walked into Urban Outfitters. 
a frisson. <laughs> the atmosphere when I walked into Urban Outfitters was like, have you ever been in a Greg's when a seagull wanders in? <laughs> Film it, film it. <laughs> he thinks it's like us. <laughs> Look at it with a bag of crisps on its face. <laughs> Get out, it's going to shit everywhere. <laughs> oh, I felt so uncomfortable. I felt so self conscious. Everything in there is for people age and size six. I felt like such an old fat cunt in there. <laughs> standing there one of the gorgeous member of staffs wafts over I love the staff they have in Urban Outfitters they've got them in Lush as well they're gorgeous they're, they're the future they're Gen Z's and they're stunning they're all sort of quite androgynous looking I've always wanted to flirt with androgyny I've never been able to but they're all stunning they're like pansexual polyamorous non-binary nymphs they're fucking amazing <laughs> And that is, that's what, that's what I have always wanted to be like. I've always wanted to explore that side of myself, but I have to, have to like over-fem myself because that, I'm a farmer's daughter and it doesn't matter how many hot showers you have, that shit will always stink on you. <laughs> I will always look like I can comfortably carry more than I weigh. <laughs> on my wedding day, I've got to know that. <laughs> this member of staff's wafts over there, it's stunning. And they had, um, is it... Is it a septum piercing, that piercing there. Oh my God, it's so cool. I've always wanted one of those piercings, but I knew I couldn't get it because if I got one of those piercings, everybody would ask me how the operation went. <laughs> That's the wrong punchline to that. I just did the punchline to the next joke. It's, it's because I got really excited about it. I was like, they're going to love the operation one. <laughs> Good job I'm filming this for something important. <laughs> I've got ADHD, so if you do have a problem with that, you hate neurodiverse people, so fuck you. <laughs> what I was going to say is, I look like a bull at a county show, but the moment's gone. <laughs> don't patronise me. No, don't patronise. It's not the Pride of Britain Awards. Wind your neck in. Come on. I don't know where I'm going to go now. I don't know where I'm going to shop. I was just wandering up and down. And I could hear beckoning me on the high street. Come in here. Like a siren on the rocks. Come on in here. It's not just for aunties. Come on in. Come on in. Have you seen our Boxing Day sales? Come on in. It was next. <laughs> You're a size 14 in here. Come on in. I know it's only a matter of time before fucking Bon Marche is patting the seat beside it. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in here. Get a little cardigan to hide your back tits. You've got a wedding coming up. Come on. <laughs> Always imagine Bob Marshall with a tab on for some reason. <laughs> Quite a bitter as well. There's a few too many of those and tells you about hand jobs they gave to sailors when they were too young. That kind of thing. <laughs> I love also gigging somewhere, and I mean this in the best possible way, York, shit enough to know what Bon Marche is. <laughs> yeah, because I'd been doing a lot of gigs down south. <laughs> they do not know what Bon Marche is. <laughs> is it a farmer's market? <laughs> and they have to hastily explain, you. oh no, it's, um, it's a shop that does like flammable clothing for women who can't use trampolines anymore. <laughs> You know what? I got extra self-conscious because, um, because on, on, I started going on TikTok, right? Now, not on TikTok because I'm like too old, but I am fucking checking it every single day. <laughs> Just watching in the shadows like a devious paedophile. Because <laughs> I don't want to get left behind. Too late. It's already fucking happened, right? <laughs> It's Gen, Gen Z, it's their app, isn't it? TikTok is absolutely their social media, and it's great. And I actually love Gen Z women in particular. They feel so much more empowered than we were, and they're so funny, and they really care about sort of social issues, and, I, I, and they're so bright as well. They're so educated. They really take in the world, and I absolutely love them. And one of their favourite things to do as well is rip the piss out of millennial women, which I was really enjoying it, because I look at millennial women that are all like, I can't adult till I've had a pumpkin spice latte. And I was like, hey, yeah, dumb bitches. <laughs> and then I watched one the other day it was like oh my god what is it with millennial women they're all obsessed with skinny jeans and side partings and I was like no no <laughs> I really thought I'd be able to t take it on the chin but I'm a fucking sore loser <laughs> just staring at my phone and I went full oh dear Jane what a sad little life <laughs> 
<laughs> threw my phone away. I, I heard myself yelling at my phone on a double duvet. Listen, I'm not going to take advice from someone who doesn't remember 9-11 and Abby Titmus, so why'd you fucking neck in? <laughs> I'm in the wrong jeans. What a thing to find out. I've looked at the jeans they're wearing and they wear, um, sk- they wear mom jeans. It's fine if you have an ironic, lithe body. <laughs> Every pair of jeans I put on are mom jeans because <laughs> I have the body of a mother. That's how that works. Or they wear high-waisted jeans. I've tried high-waisted jeans. I look like an egg with legs. <laughs> skinny jeans. We hung up. Give me a cheer for a skinny jean wearer. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. I see you, millennial women. I also know we're not letting go with a skinny jean, right? Because we remember what came before it. It's the boot-cut jean. <laughs> and we're not going back. Actually, we've re- reclaimed and reappropriated the bootleg jean, haven't we? We now use it as a handy little red flag on menu meat that wear them. <laughs> Bad news if you see a bootleg jean in the wild, isn't it? Yeah. Especially if it's paired with a cowboy boot. That's the mission statement of a rapist. Do know that. <laughs> yeah. You smell dupe, ask for Angela at the bar. You're not fucking safe. <laughs> There's men now nervously tucking. <laughs> trying to tuck it into their socks before they go to the bar. Do you know what? Jean shopping is my worst one. Because there's a part of my body I always have to negotiate with when I'm shopping, right? And it's, it's, this, it's this bit here. There's this bit here. This, um, look at me turning to the side like you can't see it from the front. <laughs> I call it my Prosecco paunch. And it's like a bum bag filled with sand that just hangs there. It's also known as a gunt. You might have heard that phrase, yeah. I love gunt, because it sounds like a lovely little German village, doesn't it? <laughs> I had two weeks in gunt, it was delightful. <laughs> like my Prosecco paunch. There's a few... <laughs> Do you know what, whenever I talk about Prosecco paunch, there's always a certain laugh in the room, and it's this... <laughs> <laughs> and I now recognise it's the laugh of a thin yoga woman. And the laugh is, <laughs> that's funny, but I'd fucking kill myself if I looked like you. <laughs> but if you don't have a Prosecco paunch, you don't have a gun, you don't know that there's some advantages to it. So I'm going to tell you about a couple very quickly. Number one, I don't want to be crass, but I can take some hammer. <laughs> yeah. I got a list of names that can vouch for that as well. <laughs> Not surnames, but... <laughs> So my Prosecco paunch gives me the greatest joy. This gunt, right, gives me so much joy. It's basically, when we get those two days of summer, I'm like, time to do all my tanning, baby. So I get a chair from the kitchen. I go and put it in the middle of my garden. I've not got garden furniture. I'm not a fucking Tory. So I put it... <laughs> Another joke that doesn't go as well down south. So I put it in the... Put it in the middle of the garden, and that's when I get, I get as naked as I can. I live in the countryside, right? So I don't really have neighbours. I've got one guy who can see into the garden. He's depressed. He's not looking at his window for three weeks. We're fine, right? <laughs> so I sit there, get as naked as I can, full spaniel's ears out, right? One continuous line from spaniel ear down onto gun. That's my look. I roll my knickers down. I suddenly get very, it's very precious, right? I, I roll my knickers down as small as I can because like, I don't want tan lines, actually. Ooh, no, I think it's really common. I don't want tan lines. I've got a bush like a badger, but I don't want tan lines. <laughs> it's got TB as well. <laughs> That's why I'm not allowed near cows. <laughs> so I lie there, drinking it in, and I think to myself, you know what, I am going to get up, and I am going to go to the freezer, and I am going to treat myself to a third magnum of the day. <laughs> Because I am a special princess and I deserve it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then about 40 minutes later, I'll actually be asked to get up and do it. And as I get up and do it, this is when the Prosecco paunch really steps in, when the gunt comes into play, right? Because as I step up, I will hear the sound of my own gunt peeling off the top of my own thigh. And it's this noise. And I've realised that's my mating call. It's, I just suddenly see a row of bald heads along my fence like that. <laughs> just divorced dads were like, is that low self-esteem I can hear? <laughs> Do you want to come pizza hut and be a mum for two hours? <laughs> I want to say pizza express, but you ruined that as well. <laughs> I 
<laughs> genuinely, I'll tell you this quickly because I wore it. <laughs> it's the first time I've shown it in front of an audience. I think it's so, so funny, this bum bag full of sand, right? I was like, if I ever had merch, right, I'd have fucking bum bags done with gun on. Well, it's happened. I've had... <laughs> yeah, I'm on... <laughs> I'm on tour at the moment, right? Because so many people, I kept joking about, I want to get, I want to get merch with gun on it. And so many people kept up coming up afterwards and buying it, right? Trying to buy it. I was like, I oh, fucking should get these made, right? But my fear is everyone says they want merch and they never actually buy it. And I, I've ordered a thousand of these cunts. <laughs> and I'm worried I'm going to have to go back to North Wales with 998 of them. <laughs> Hide them in my cellar and never look at them again. Now, where I live in North Wales, you might know the island of Anglesey, very beautiful. There's a nuclear power plant there. My deepest fear is that it blows up, flattens the island, no one's allowed back there for thousands of years, and when they finally do, they wander back and go, there's an untouched cellar here. <laughs> they, go they go down there and they find 998 gunman bags, and they stare at them for a while and go, he must have been their king. <laughs> Guilty feminists, you've been so, so nice. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Kerry Pritchard McLean, was that you finishing your set? Were you sure? Oh yeah, I just oh, didn't know if I had in the wing. I just didn't know if I was meant to go back off or not. No, you're not meant to go back off. But okay. I, so, I had this horrible panic as I was coming on that I was like, she's just in the middle of a joke. She's got, the, she's landed the first laugh, I, and I'm literally walking. Oh, did it not feel strong enough to close on? <laughs> it really did, and that's why I started coming out. But then, with a the look on your face, I was like, this is so professional. Why don't we keep this in the podcast? <laughs> what, well, maybe not very good at stand-up? No, you're amazing at stand-up. No, I genuinely was like, oh my God, I thought by the look on your face, you were going, don't. Anyway, the audience don't need to know this. <laughs> Imagine if we had an internal monologue. <laughs> Matthew's feeling a whole lot better at his job now. <laughs> We, we mocked Matthew for not being a very good English teacher because he didn't know Virginia Woolf. But then it turns out, because I couldn't hear properly from the wings, I didn't know when to come on. Um, can I give you this? I, I absolutely, and this is a phrase I had to explain to you backstage, get wide for a clipboard. <laughs> Been a night of firsts for you, hasn't it? I mean, Boater boating. I, <laughs> Maybe if you'd have done the first, you'd know the second. <laughs> I'm not saying anything else for the whole night. <laughs> Got the wrong clipboard. Oh, really? um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, it's been a while since I've seen you, Kiri. Yeah. Have you been having a feminist time or a guilty time, or both? Ooh, interesting. I, uh, I think maybe, actually probably just a feminist time. I think, you know, because we, we just, when you're allowed to be feral in your own home, Mm. I think that's the most feminist you can be. Yeah, my, my, my partner went visibly grey. Because he's like, I didn't sign up to whatever this is. <laughs> so yeah, I, I feel like I've been more feminist. And not just because I've been growing my pubes out. <laughs> I know what you mean. I rather wonder if the next step for feminism is not where we start to put people's humanity ahead of their identity if you see what I mean, like the whole point of fighting, the reason we fight for our identities is because we feel at times we're being treated as less than human or substandard or like, and so there's a part of me that thinks when women can reveal their fighting, fucking, hungry, joyous, terrified selves, we will have won. Yeah, when we're all pissing standing up is what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I felt like just, I, I could. You can't hear very well back there, but was, did I miss someone run a course in it? Is that what, yeah, is that? You really can't hear backstage, so you are just fucking guessing. Uh, yes, you must pee downhill. Can, I think if you just like really, I've done it so much. Um, and I Outside, think if you just outdoor our first go pick, pick. Yeah, yeah I, I was farmer's daughter. That was oh. all I did. Um, <laughs> well, your whole childhood was peeing, squatting. No, standing up. Lots of standing up. Standing up. How yeah, do you, you pee got, standing up? You just got. That's what we're talking about, right? Well, no. The instructions that Jill was giving us were very clearly about squatting. But you, what you do is you. If I remember it, too correctly, vulnerable. You can pick. Don't go quiet on me. You can pee standing up if you put your mind to it. And don't give a shit about your trainers. But, 
Kiri, what do you do? How do you pee standing up? You must have, do you take your, if you the clues in the name? <laughs> but right, you know how men will just go up to or pe- like people with a penis will go up to mm. a fence or whatever and stand there, just like relax your hips into it, and it really. <laughs> But like, men don't can kind of ghost me on this. There must be someone who can vouch for me here. Men, men and other people who have penises can sort of point the penis like a fire hose, though, yeah? Oh, I'm not saying I could, like, knock a can off a fence with it. Like, it's not... <laughs> and, uh, I mean, as a farmer's daughter, you would know the fence might be electric. <laughs> it would be extremely dangerous. Stay in school, kids, and don't pee on electric fences. There's someone who, as soon as I mentioned peeing standing up, has, has really forced their arm into the air there. Yes. Could we please have... Do you want to go now? Is that this what... Is like a town... <laughs> this is like a town hall. This is exactly what I was talking about. I think the town hall... We're try... Could you please advise... Yeah. Okay. And I'm like, yeah, I'll be for a pet. So we get to the dog walk and I go, I might need one today. Okay, this is so Yorkshire. I need you to <laughs> say it into the microphone. Do you want me to translate? Can you, can you come down? Can you just come down and I'll give you the mic? Because it needs to start again. I don't want to be saying this into the mic with my voice. <laughs> Born resident. Absolutely not. It's, it would be verging on cultural appropriation. <laughs> What's your name? Donna. Donna. Donna, just come up. Is this the same Donna or are you all called Donna? <laughs> oh, there's stairs there. There's stairs there. Okay, great. Big round of applause for Donna, everybody. Okay, we'll give Donna one of our mics and we can share. She said she wasn't going to come up on stage. mate's a liar. <laughs> She's coming up pretty quickly. Donna, everybody! Shoes off. She's gone full Joss Stone. Look at this. Welcome. Donna's made herself at home. Take a, take a seat, Donna. Take, take a seat there. <laughs> so, when me and me are going, <laughs> we go on a dog walk. It says... Need a way. So I says no. Before you leave, right? Before we leave, right? We get up to a bit where we're gonna like dog off lead. <laughs> <laughs> we need a piss. So you piss out? No, no, no. I says I'm gonna hang on because he says I'll take you home because it's not dignified for a lady. day. <laughs> but I ain't no lady. day. <laughs> Tell us more, Donna. So, we have a German shepherd, so everyone looks at us like we've got this man-eating beast, as it is. So we're there going, no, 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 come back, it's not going to eat your children, it's fine. Anyway, so, get back, and I go, I need, I need a fish. This is like what Parkinson's was like in the 70s, you know. <laughs> Let anyone pissed on, be like, yeah, let's have a chat. <laughs> So I, I, I get to a quiet area and I says to my husband, I'm going to have to go, love. And he says, right, he says, those trees look good. And then he's shouting, Donna, Donna, there's people coming. <laughs> Fuck's sake. <laughs> so you don't know whether to nip it, squeeze it. You don't know whether to pull your pants up. You don't know. You, what are you doing? You don't know. You don't know. Don't know what you're doing. Don't know. So how close are they? I'm shouting, Ryan, how close are they, love? <laughs> and he's going, well, they're pretty fucking close, love. You need to get your fucking knickers up. <laughs> Hell, half a fucking Barbie have seen my... <laughs> do you do stand-up comedy ever, Donna? No. I feel like you should. I feel like I feel like you've already got a type five. Yeah. yeah. All puns intended. <laughs> or a baggy three. <laughs> well, we agree now that I off I go for a wee wee before we go. <laughs> standing up though, Donna, can you pee standing up? Because Kiri Pritchard McLean maintains that as a Welsh farmer's daughter. She can 
Well, I come from a farming background. Shocking. Why, no. <laughs> game recognised game. And you just know the way to do it. Yeah. And you see people coming in the background, and I'm going, Ryan, there's people, I can see them. So, what's the technique? Because <laughs> Kiri says, just relax your hips. Have you, pee- have you ever peed standing up, Donna? I am doing it on stage. No. <laughs> He'll be very upset. It's, it, it, it's against our marital vows. <laughs> is Brian here tonight? Brian. Brian, is he? Uh, t- he just picks me up and drops me off. <laughs> he doesn't get involved. <laughs> if I'm honest, Honor, I do understand. Uh, but all 16 years. 16 years, yeah. And, time. Yeah. And I mean, and still going strong though. I mean, We've got a daughter as well. She's 12. She's, she's born in May. Is she in tonight? No, but she will be next year. I mean, I'm, I was sort of wishing she were, just so I could ask her some questions. But um, I think you're amazing. And I think you should, she should consider... You're really funny. Yeah. Really naturally funny. Really? How far yeah. are you from Leeds? Well, I only live round corner. I'm not far. Like. Because in Leeds, you could do. I'm sure there's an open mic night. You could do. You could do that. Well, there's nights in York. There's night. Is there? Me- message me on social. I'll give you a list of gigs you should do. Okay. Yeah. Donna, everybody. Thank you. More talent. You know, it's fine to say it. I think it's the touching, it's the issue. <laughs> it's all right, Donna. <laughs> all right, is she going to get down those safely? Stuart, Stuart's with her. No, Stuart's helping. Okay, great. Stuart knows what he's doing. Um, Fucking Donna. Yeah. <laughs> if she's not co hosting by the time we get back yeah. next year, I'll be very surprised. <laughs> We told you you'd be hearing from local feminists. <laughs> hmm. Probably ready for our guest. Yeah. That was our informal guest. We've now got a formal <laughs> guest. Hello, guilty feminists of Australia and New Zealand. We are coming to you. And by we, I do mean Grace Petrie and I are getting on a plane. And we are flying 24 hours to see you. Uh, I am so excited about this because I haven't been to Australia for two and a half years. And it's where I was born and raised. So I usually come back at least once or twice a year to see my family and all my guilty feminists massive. And this is going to be quite mosh for me. I'll be honest with you. Uh, if you're going to be at any of these shows, you're probably going to see tears as well as laughter. I just want to be with you whole uh, down under gang again. Like the shows, they're a legendary they always feel so powerful, so important, so joyful, so hilarious, so fraught with resistance, feminism, and song. Um, I just can't wait. So I'm going to tell you where we're coming. On the 13th of July, we're going to be in Adelaide. On the 15th of July, we're going to be in Perth. On the 17th of July, we're going to be in Canberra. On the 18th of July, we're going to be in Canberra. But please bear in mind, the shows will be totally different. we get different guests. So you can come to both of those. 19th of July, we're going to be in Brisbane. 20th of July, we're going to be in Melbourne. 22nd of July, Christchurch. 23rd of July, Auckland. 24th of July, Wellington. 27th of July, Sydney. Confirmed guest car host include Steph Tisdale in Brisbane. Celia Picola will be in Melbourne. Geraldine Hickey will be in Adelaide. And Cal Wilson will be everywhere else. That's Canberra. That's Perth. That's all the New Zealand dates. Uh, get your tickets now. We will also have Grace Petrie with us uh, singing up a storm and local feminists who we will be talking to and going in for the deep dive conversation. Do not miss it. I'm desperate to be with you. Please be there if you possibly can. Send people, bring everyone on your WhatsApp groups, introduce people to it that hasn't been there before. Let's have a kiki. Our guest today is a birth and postnatal specialist who is passionate about ensuring that every woman and other birthing person feels empowered in her birth experience and has continuity of care in her or their transition to motherhood or parenthood. Please welcome Melody Robinson! (laughs) 
my mistake. Yeah. I feel we should have given that to Donna to take back to a seat. I feel like she'd have good things to chip in. Um, now, um, Mel, um, you are a birth and postnatal specialist, and you are all about the choices of the birth experience and continuity of care for transition into parenthood. Um, what has driven you into this? Because to be honest, for me, that sounds like a lot of um, uh, bodily fluids. <laughs> and it also sounds like a lot of working with a lot of very stressed, like terrified people as well. Is that true? I don't know if they're all um, stressed and terrified. Oh, sorry, that would just be me. If I, were, <laughs> I just feel if you're carrying a human inside your body, you know, like, yeah. you know, I'm, maybe not te- stressed and terrified might be too much, but like an- anxious at times? Yeah, definitely anxious. Can, just curious as to the future, yeah. what, how, how it might be. Desperately downgrading now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Here, I, about the future. Well, okay, I would be curious as to how the human being was going to exit my body. Yes. That would be something on my mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I inc- when we were chatting backstage, I incorrectly called you a midwife. What, what you do is different, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a birth doula and postnatal specialist. Um, a midwife provides um, medical support um, for in maternity services, where a doula provides practical and emotional support um, during pregnancy, in labour and birth, and then in the postnatal period as well. Because th- another thing we were chatting about, which is fascinating, because like all, all my mates are, are like dropping kids at the moment. That's what's going on in their lives. And I'm like, go at it. Um, <laughs> but I, I didn't... Uh, the, some of them, they're informed to different amounts. And some people are like, I want to be across everything. And some people are like, no, you know, I'm in the, in the hands of professionals. But with, for none of the, the reoccurring thing with all of them is it's never been straightforward. So... I mean, how present are you there in in those different stages for people? I think, so for me personally, it's it's really important to ensure that everybody is informed and is making really, um, truly um, evidence-based, information-rich decisions around what's what's going to be, you know, what they're going to be involved in and Mm. um, what kind of care they want for them and what's going to be right for them. Um, so it's navigating, care. yeah, I was going to say navigating the the medical um, management of maternity um, care is is tricky. Um, mm. Yeah, somebody's got to take their pills <laughs> <laughs> or the bins out. <laughs> Bin day. That's the only alarm I have on my phone. <laughs> is, um, is care often imposed upon women and other people who can give birth? Is it often just are they often just told this is how it's going to be and you have to be informed to know you could say, oh, no, actually, I'd rather have it be like this or I, is this an option for me? Uh, is, it, is it often just presented as this is, what's, this is what's going to happen to you? Yeah, absolutely. There is a standard medical model of care that unless you ask for something different um, is what, what you can expect to, to get. And what's that model? So it's um, um, at different appointments during pregnancy, different scans that, um, and blood tests and, and um, screening tests and that kind of thing, which you can decline. Um, um, and then in the la- for labour, um, there's routine vaginal examinations, which is a real um, hot topic um, in the birth working world, um, where people often will want to decline that, but find that they aren't allowed uh, or, or it's very difficult for them to kind of move from one care setting in the hospital to the labour <coughs> ward potentially unless they've had a vaginal examination. Um, so, What's the vaginal examination meant to be doing? So it does two things. The one is um, it is supposed to determine um, cervical dilation. Right. Um, and basically that's based on a study that was done in the 1950s um, which um, standardised <laughs> um, normal uh, childbirth care um, by a guy called um, Dr. Friedman and it's Friedman's Curve. So it's a graphic representation of what normal labour should look like. Um, and so if a woman or birthing person's labour doesn't um, look like it's being plotted along that graph, medical intervention is then um, 
introduced to, uh, to speed things up. Oh, I see. So this is where, like, if you're watching an episode of Friends, it'll say, you know, she's three centimetres dilated, she's four fingers dilated, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, or you've given birth, one of those. It's either you've seen it on Friends or you've given birth. Um, or you've been... Thank God for E4, otherwise I would not... <laughs> No. Donna, do you remember this when you were pregnant with your daughter? No, she doesn't remember tonight. <laughs> Donna, do you remember anyone looking and going, you're this so many centimetres dilated? Well, they told me. <laughs> they told me that I was two centimetres and to go for a walk, and then I kicked off, and my husband said she was getting angry, have a look. And then I passed the day, and I was nine centimetres, and she shot down. <laughs> So if you're listening at home, she was two centimetres. She went for a walk. No, she ref- her husband kicked said, off. Oh, she kicked off. Her husband said she's getting angry. Then he said, there's people coming. <laughs> They're pretty fucking close. And then uh, cut to nine centimetres, she shot out. Is that, I mean, that story there, because that's the other thing is, like, there is no normal, right? And especially, like, I, not that, like, in the 50s they were well weird, but, like... That seems like quite an archaic thing to be basing modern technology and birthing methods on. So yes, it's hideous. there we go. Donna said it's hideous. hideous. Yeah. Is it? yeah. So, we, so wh- everybody labors differently. Everybody's cervix does different things at different times. It's a snapshot of that moment if we're looking at it from a cervical dilation perspective. But if healthcare professionals are wanting to determine the position of the baby, they can often feel the soft spots on the baby's head to kind of... And that's really useful in terms of vaginal examinations, but the kind of standard plotting of the cervical dilation isn't useful. Um, And a lot of people find that really quite traumatic and invasive. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of other stuff to kind of navigate. Someone's down there with a tape measure, basically. No, you do it with your fingers. And we all have different size hands, and Mm. it's a guesstimation, really. Right. So it's just how many fingers you can get in there. But you might not want any fingers in there at all if you've got a baby coming out of there. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we were chatting about as well is that the you were saying that there's there's it feels like there's a lot of medical intervention, and and maybe from your perspective that that's unnecessary. Is is that am I putting words in your mouth about that? I think at the moment there's definitely um, a spotlight on on um, medical interventions um, uh, in in the labour and birthing process. Um, I think obstetric units for those people who are poorly and really need that support are fantastic. Unfortunately, we're in a model of care where healthy um, people are kind of um, having to kind of have their care provided to them with this medical model as well. Mm. And so the fallout from that is the trauma that um, a lot of people are experiencing. And you said that there was a big issue with mental health. Huge. What Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, it's obviously worsened over the last few years, but in 2019 a book was published called Why Birth Trauma Matters by Emma Svansberg and... She highlighted that one in three women um, and birthing people will experience an aspect of their labor and birth process as traumatic. And often it's about how they're made to feel. Often we hear people saying, oh, I I wasn't allowed, or they said I had to do X, Y, or Z. And so that autonomy is taken away from them. Um, And then if we look at things like the Embrace Report, it it highlights that... um, um, maternal suicide is the leading cause of death in the first year postnatally in the UK. My God. What? In 2021. So it's just. Oh my God. Shocking. That's really shocking. So then something does need to be done. Well, how so, scary is it that the most vulnerable people in society <laughs> to be more vulnerable? I mean, it's, it's obvious that, you know, you give birth. Are pregnant, you're vulnerable. If you're a woman, you're vulnerable. It all adds up, and then suddenly people go, Oh, what a surprise that it's all gone wrong. Mm. And it's horrendous. It is, yeah. Do you uh, you think it's been sort of, yeah, let's give Donna a call. I want to ask if it's the pandemic has compounded those issues as well, because so many many aspects of healthcare, I think, 
the cracks that were there have, have been blown wide open yeah. after the past couple of years. Yeah. yeah, they definitely have. And like I say, so that um, the one in three um, uh, study that, um, that was published in 2019, there are studies coming out now about the impact that the pandemic has had, but obviously it's going to have amplified 10 times. Um, you know, it's just highlighted the, the challenges that maternity services or women and birthing people were experiencing in maternity services before. If we could give you a magic wand, Mel, what would you change? If, you, if I had a magic wand, funding... Funding, funding for... Well, that won't be a problem with this government. <laughs> they love funding stuff. They especially love funding stuff uh, that doesn't affect them. Um, we and... should tell them that one of their mates is all people giving birth and they'll be fine. <laughs> if, if all people giving birth was the brother-in-law of someone in the cabinet, <laughs> then it would be funded. Uh, but sadly, uh, I don't think so. So, funding... Yeah, funding for more midwives, um, continuity of carer has been shown to be best practice, but, you know, midwives are burnt out and leaving in the droves because they just can't cope with the system. Mm. Funding for mother and baby units um, and funding for more postnatal support um, because once babies are born all the, the focus and the attention that has been given to mothers and, and birthing people in pregnancy and birth disappears and the focus is then all on the babies. Mm. Mm. That's so interesting. And is there... Um, oh, got, got ADHD and then I started... I went, oh, there's a fire exit there. Quickly, <laughs> before you ask the question, count how many there are. And if you don't do that, you've lost. Wow. <laughs> I have ADHD. Welcome. I have also been diagnosed with ADHD, but I haven't done that. I've, in fact, thought, could I quickly interrupt this? Um, <laughs> I talk over Kiri now. That's what my brain yeah, has said. Um, no, have you got a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, about fire extinguishers, though. No, 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 no. It wasn't. It was about... If, if there's something... What advice would you give to people who, like, are expecting or, 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 you know, there's a birth in their future? Because I think sometimes people don't feel, especially in that situation, it must be quite hard for, to advocate yourself when you might be in great amount of pain or stress or, you know, whacked off your tits on drugs. So, like, what would you give them as a tool to take into giving birth? Get informed. Do as, be as informed as possible. Rally support. Get a doula. Um, there's a doula for everybody. Um, and yeah, just I think being informed and supported ensures you're empowered, and that's my tagline really informed and supported is, is empowered. And where can they get that information? What information? All the when you say when you say be informed, so um, there are fantastic um, uh, social media. Um, so there's evidence based birth, which is kind of um, that's an American model, but. Um, Everybody, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the, um, how, you, how you labour in birth is, is going to be the same. So Evidence-based birth, That's an follow, them on, follow them on social media. Yeah. Is there anywhere else that we can go for information that's... She's being shy because I know she's got training starting in September, but she doesn't want to say. <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can absolutely um, find me at allthingsbirthandbeyond.co.uk. Allthingsbirthandbeyond.co.uk. Yeah. Okay, and we can find out uh, options, uh, ideas, what you can and can't say no to, what's wise, what's just something a man made up in the 50s, and we still do because that's tradition. I mean, I love tradition when it comes to Christmas, <laughs> but not so much when it comes to vaginal expirations. <laughs> You, then you're having a shit Christmas, mate. <laughs> and on that note... <laughs> I, I, uh, every, I've been on this once, maybe twice before, every time I ruin it. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Mel, is there anything that I want to ask? Is there anything you wish we'd ask and you're going to go, oh, I wish I got to talk about that? Yeah, so I was going to say birthrights.org, that's a fantastic um, source of information. <laughs> AIMS is another, which stands for Association for the Improvement to Maternity Services. Is it free of charge? Is it free? Which, which one? Uh, the, all of these. Uh, is all of this free? So all the information is free. 
information is always free. Um, and there are some doulas that provide um, support free at the point of delivery. Um, others will charge. Um, some do bartering systems. Bartering systems? Yeah. We, what could I give you to doula me? I could come and paint my house. I could come and paint your house and you'll doula me? Yeah. What would you give me for a gunt bum bag? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't say a vaginal experience. I'm just, it's all I'm asking, Kiri. It's all I'm asking. Um, well, listen, this is great to know that you can barter with your doula. So if you, what if you, you know, knit jumpers or something like that, you can, if you're an Etsy style person, don't pay for a doula. I've just heard you can butter. But if you can afford a doula... If you can afford a doula, please... Yeah, yeah. Please pay your doula and tip appropriately. Yeah, because we need to be careful that it's not like comedians where sort of people go, oh, do the gig for the exposure. So it's like, pull a human out of me for the exposure. <laughs> That's actually a really good point. <laughs> Feminists pay people, but also I do like a bartering system just because I think we should be... Uh, it, sometimes, if, if it's something you really want, because I think that sort of slight gets us around capitalism. That. Can you do the what, sorry? Can I get three things for videos? Can you get three things for doing videos? Yeah. Is that Ali? Yeah. You did, you got Prosecco. <laughs> that was a classic piece of bartering. <laughs> yeah, if anyone else wants Prosecco, you know, offer to rub Kiri's shoulders. Um, um, listen. Don't say that, Donna's already sexually assaulted me. <laughs> another thing that will be cut yeah. out of the podcast. Um, uh, well, listen, this has been absolutely uh, wonderful to hear. I'm sure people all around the world are going to be listening to this, and a lot of our listeners, a certain percentage is going to be pregnant. Is, any, is anyone uh, pregnant right now? Just give us a cheer. Okay. Did you learn anything from this? Okay. What will you be taking from it? <laughs> Google a doula. What a catchphrase. What, what, do you, what do you do? You work at the what? Uni. The uni? Well, you, I don't know. Can you offer a doula, like, free night classes? Get her one of those, like, um, student rail cards. That's worth a lot, isn't it? <laughs> you cannot do that. Um, Mel, you have been an absolutely wonderful guest. Mel Robertson, everybody! Um, you have been an absolutely wonderful audience. Please welcome back our final act. It's the incredible Grace Petrie. <laughs> York! <laughs> have you had a wonderful time, York? <laughs> You've had a wonderful time as well. I suspected I was going to have a wonderful time here tonight. I'm very, very, very fond of York. And uh, I've only become more fond of York recently because I, so I uh, am not, uh, me personally, I'm not a monarchist, right? I'm not a monarchist. <laughs> I know, surprising news, I know. <laughs> but, uh, and it's funny because when you say to people that you're not a monarchist, there, there are some people um, who, when you say you're not a monarchist, uh, some people sort of take that to mean that what you're saying is that you've got, like, individual personal problems with the Queen. Right, which, uh, which, which I, 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 I do. Um, uh, I don't, I don't. I've, she, listen, she's, she's just an, an, an older lady that I've not met. But Prince Andrew, he can get to fuck, right? Um, as I believe your fine city told him fairly recently. So it feels like the right night to sing this song. Um, I wrote this song quite a few years ago uh, because I was thinking about not being a monarchist and I was thinking about uh, the national anthem that we have in this country and how I don't feel very represented by it. I know a lot of people that don't feel very represented by it. So um, I had a go at writing a new national anthem uh, for Britain and, uh, and I've sent it to Downing Street and I think we are days away from uh, <laughs> being officially adopted. This is, uh, this is, you, you give, it, give it a go, this one, and, uh, and uh, you, you tell me if you think this would be better before the football matches. I personally think it would. It's called God Save the Hungry, and it goes like this. <laughs> a 
my energy tighter Not thinking it's cool That some were born to suffer While some were born to rule Does that make me a traitor? Before you toss that word around Please understand that I love this land of mine it's true, God ain't my thing But if he was, I'd rather sing For all of the refugees Perishing in foreign seas Those bodies washed up on the shores We're fleeing our state-sponsored wars And our leader sees nothing wrong So I wrote him a brand new song That goes, God save the hungry God save the poor and God save those desperate souls whose lives were torn apart by a war. God save the homeless and those with disabilities. And all the other targets of this heartless ideology. And there's a long and shameful list of folks we need God to assist. But those who sleep in palaces at night think they're doing all right. Britain could be greater if it had fairness at its heart. Yeah, this nation altogether is more than the sum of its parts, but they'll call you a traitor for even daring to believe a sleight of hand from those who bleed this land's right. It's true, God ain't my thing But if he was, I'd rather sing For all of the refugees Perishing in foreign seas Those bodies washed up on the shores We're fleeing our state-sponsored wars And our leader sees nothing wrong So I wrote him a brand new song That goes, God save the hungry And God save the poor God save those desperate souls whose lives were torn apart by war. God save the homeless and those with disabilities. And all the other targets of this heartless ideology. And there's a long and shameful list of folks we need God to assist. But those who sleep in palaces at night, I think they're doing all right. Give me a song that won't stick in my throat. If you agree, the only power we should respect is that come from a vote, yeah. Give me a song that won't stick in my throat to see our millionaire politicians say we're all in the same boat. Yeah, it's true, God ain't my thing. But if he was, I'd rather sing For all of the refugees Perishing in foreign seas Those bodies washed up on the shores We're fleeing our state-sponsored wars And our leader sees nothing wrong So raise your voice and sing along, yeah God save the hungry God save the poor God save those desperate souls whose lives were torn apart by war. God save the homeless and those with disability. And all the other targets of this heartless ideology. And my gratitude to all the brave soldiers spinning in their grave. To see the eaten mess that they've made of. The sacrifice they gave to tear apart the welfare state. And all that ever made Britain great. While well, those who sleep in palaces tonight, they're still doing all right. They're still doing all right. Thank you very much. You have been listening to the Guilty Panthers with me, Deborah Francis Mike, and my very special guests. Kiri Pritchard McLean, Jessica Mostacu, and Melody Robinson, with music from Grace Petrie. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The producer for the Spontaneity Shop was Tom Salinsky. Thanks to Rachel Croft, Gina DCO, Stuart Arnold, and everyone at the York Barbican, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com.
songs. Uh, was it Matthew, the, the chap we were talking to about Virginia Woolf? Yeah? The third one was her autobiography, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? All right, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one was for you at the back. <laughs> and again. <laughs> I'll entertain you all one at a time. <laughs> so I'm going to sing you a song. We're going to sing this one together. Are you up for that? Yeah. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.